Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. A state of total confusion reigns in Western capitals over what to do about the catastrophe unfolding in Syria and Iraq. The UK Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, rules out Britain going back to war in Iraq and is instantly repudiated by David Cameron, still at the time of recording, the British Prime Minister, who insists that, quote, all options remain open. In the U.S., things are no more clear. There, the commander-in-chief of the U.S. military, President Obama, is impudently contradicted by the top military brass. The president says that there will be absolutely no American boots on the ground. And yet, the generals, including the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, tells the Senate Armed Services Committee that there will be, in fact, boots on the ground, if necessary. Cameron claims he can bomb ISIS in Syria from over Syrian airspace without the permission of the Syrian government. The said Syrian government is armed and dangerous and entirely within its legal rights to shoot down any and all military aircraft over their territory and has the military hardware to do so. Neither the US nor the UK governments, who some argue caused the disaster in the first place, have any intention of helping the actual government of Iraq a government only in power because of them. And they won't even deliver to Baghdad the weapons and planes they have already paid for, even though ISIS is at the gates. In Paris this week, a summit of the great and the gruesome came together to discuss the existential threat of ISIS. But the two countries actually doing something meaningful mm. about that threat, Syria and Iran, were, of course, not invited. Confused? You won't be after you've heard our first guest Hasib Rizvi, a commentator on the region and part of Digital Resistance. Hasib, welcome to the show. Hi, George. Tell the viewers, first of all, how things are on the ground now in Iraq. What territory does ISIS hold? Who's fighting them? Are there any uh, indications of a change of, uh, in the military situation on the ground? So the situation is a bit, uh, it, it varies um, from parts to parts, but Primarily, uh, we're talking about northeast Syria and northwest Iraq being under heavy ISIS influence. Um, not necessarily blanket control, but heavy segments of those areas. Um, and within those areas that they have control, um, there's various battles taking place uh, along the borders of those, those regions that they control. So, for example, they're fighting with Kurds. Um, they're fighting against other Syrian rebel groups such as al-Nusra and the Islamic Front, um, as well as, I think, the Free Syrian Army as well. Um, and in towards Iraq, they're fighting obviously the Iraqi uh, armed forces as well as Shia militias that are, you know, defending their territory against, uh, uh, you know, further ISIS expansion. So at the moment, ISIS are involved in a lot of uh, battles and skirmishes. That's a lot of fighting. They're, they're, they're fighting quite a few people at the same time, to be honest with you. And um, the the recent kind of resurgence of the Iraqi armed forces as well as support from the, you know, U.S. airstrikes and stuff has. Um, prevented, you know, further expansion, um, but they're sh showing no sign of stopping, um, and that's kind of worrying. They seem to be still, you know, going about their day-to-day -day executions in, in a in a very kind of, you know, sophisticated and uh, well-planned um, manner. And they're still controlling major Iraqi cities. Absolutely, and they, and you know, like in Syria, for example, in uh, in the in the city of Raqqa, they're you know they more or less they 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 run the show there completely. Which is thought to be the place where they're carrying out these hideous execution of foreigners. Yeah, yeah, that part and you know various border border towns between Iraq and Syria, uh, where there is you know very loose control of of anything, uh, is, is where they're operating and and they have you know pretty good control over those areas. Now you mentioned the U.S. airstrikes. Uh, I'm of the I've seen U.S. airstrikes. I've seen them in Vietnam, I've seen them in Cambodia, I've seen them in the Iraq war, I've seen them in Afghanistan. These are not meaningful U.S. airstrikes, which leads me to wonder why. If the United States was really as concerned about ISIS as they say they are and that we should be, 
they'd be bombing them a lot more seriously than they are. These are very desultory, very occasional, and very small airstrikes. Why? Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, uh, adding on to what you're saying, uh, they should have reacted much sooner, one would imagine. Um, yeah, it's taken them this long to kind of react to it, whilst you know the previous uh, Prime Minister Nouri Maliki, you know, was constantly uh, pleading to America for you know support against the the, the growing threat of uh, you know militancy in, in his country, but you know it, was, it fell on deaf ears basically. Um, but what you see is as soon as, for example, ISIS started threatening the Kurdish region, is when America all of a sudden started taking things well, a seriously. only there in the Kurdish yeah. region, where and their oil interests where, are. Where the oil interests are. And where are. they want to break Iraq up well, from. There you go. And, and you know, it's a tr strategic place for them, uh, you know, the Kurdistan, because, you know, you know, the good ties with Israel, for example. And, you know, you heard stories about Kurd Kurdistan, you know, selling oil to Israel, you know, just a matter of weeks after ISIS took over and stuff like that, completely illegally. Um, but you see that America and the West generally only reacted then, not when, you know, uh, 2,000 or so uh, Shia, you know, army cadets were massacred. Why can't the regional players uh, sort this matter out themselves? What you have at the moment is this very confusing kind of blurred lines uh, that exist where, you know, um, whilst Saudi Arabia and all these, these, these countries that essentially went to Paris for, for, for a day out, Sure. were the ones essentially that kind of allowed ISIS to exist in the first place, you know, for turning a blind eye to, you know, weapons and, and, and money being trafficked to them. Um, and now they realize that, you know, it's, it's going to come back to bite them. So now they're trying to react. But it's, it's, it's a bit too late because the people inside these countries already, inside Saudi Arabia, inside Qatar, they're, they're, they've been fed the sectarian rhetoric already. So they buy the ISIS line very easily. Um, you see already that, you know, um, in, in places like Jordan, um, and Saudi Arabia, <coughs> many ISIS flags have been raised, and you know there are a lot of people. So the opposite of feeling, feeling threat. Exactly, threatened. exactly. So um, to be honest with you, Saudi Arabia or you know any of these Sunni Gulf states to kind of try and you know intervene militarily against ISIS would just be uh, counterproductive as well, just as much as it would be for the U.S. to do so. Um, which then makes it another sticky situation that if Iran and Syria were the only ones to kind of uh, attack ISIS, then, then it becomes, oh, uh, you know, Shias are attacking Sunnis. Hasib, there's a state of confusion. There's no Islamic state, but there's a state of confusion reigning uh, over all this. I mean, even in ontological terms. What exactly are ISIS? Who are they? What do they want? ISIS for, you know, if you try and simplify exactly what they are, essentially is, 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 is a collection of, of ruthless, um, angry and violent individuals that have uh, come together under, under a false notion of, of you know, a caliphate, under, under, under some sort of illusion that they're, they're trying to do a good thing for the world. Um, and, and, and their ethos is essentially being fed by something that has been prevalent in Saudi Arabia for so long. Um, under the teachings of Wahhabism and, and Salafism. And I understand that obviously not all Wahhabis and not all Salafis are, you know, uh, no, as extreme as ISIS. However, the, 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 the fundamentals behind uh, these, these um, you know, these sects have, have really spurred on uh, the, the kind of ideological principles for why ISIS go about doing the things that they do. And furthermore, it's like, <clears throat> it seems that they've kind of tried to, go one above al-Qaeda with their ruthlessness. They, they, they decide that, you know, we're going to stand out. You know, this is going to be our brand mm. almost. Mm. And, and the way they, they celebrate and glorify that their violence and, and, and dehumanize those that they're killing, uh, it's, it's actually pretty chilling. And I don't think we've seen, um, you know, a, a the group worst like of it or the no, end I mean, of it. I mean, doing, uh, from the Free Syrian Army, we've already witnessed the most horrible scenes. Uh, and they, and they and were the moderate ones, by the way. They were the moderates. They were the, the moderate, moderate heart eaters, you mean? Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we haven't actually seen ISIS eating hearts yet. That's probably something that's uh, still to come. They behave like a kind of death cult. Yeah. There seems nothing Islamic about them. Yeah. I yeah. hate when people call them the Islamic State because they're neither Islamic nor are no, they no, 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 a state. state. Yeah. Uh, how do they find any theological justification for the mass execution of helpless handcuffed uh, prisoners in, in uh, wartime? How do they justify theologically slicing off the heads of aid workers and journalists that fall into their hands and videoing it uh, mm. uh, for the 
entertainment, presumably of their own side. Their, their justification is essentially that anyone that disagrees with their very specific set of thoughts is, is not worthy of life, essentially, um, especially when you're on, on their land. So, um, But it's not their land, is it? Well, the person slicing the heads off of these uh, American and British uh, journalists are uh, thought to be uh, English. Yeah. Well, they're uh, from London. That's, that's the one thing that I don't confuse. Yeah. Young men from London, yeah. you know, growing up in this modern, you yeah. know, global city, and then so, so, so going back to them. them. Their land is essentially this, this the Islamic caliphate land, you know? So you've seen the view of the picture, I'm sure you've seen the picture of where they want to go eventually. So they, 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 they've carved this section out for themselves, and, and whatever they say goes in this area. You've se I, I've seen videos uh, of, of scholars, or, or sorry, their clerics rather, where they tell you that, you know, when you're cutting someone's head, you should enjoy it. It, should, it shouldn't be like, you're, you know, when you kill an animal, you should, you know, do that very mercifully. But when you kill a, a human being, uh, because he's an enemy of God, you should enjoy it. Take your time. Um, so it's very, very disturbing. There's this very kind of uh, strong lust towards violence within this group. Um, that is, is, I don't think we've seen it before. I don't, I don't think I've seen a group like this book before. No, it's no. really hell on earth, is it? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, as in, I think, I think it was one of the newspapers, The Guardian or something, that, that introduced uh, ISIS in the British media as, here's a group that's worse than Al-Qaeda. And that stood out to me as well, thinking, that is a good way to put it, as in Al-Qaeda uh, are bad. But they make Al-Qaeda look, like, uh, look like Boy Scouts. Which, yeah. <laughs> now, how do we uh, follow uh, digital resistance and what do you do? Uh, so what we do, we collate news um, from various uh, media outlets uh, to try and kind of put, put together a, you know, a storyline that, that makes sense, that, that's actually true as to what's happening, as well as that we provide analysis um, and opinions on, on various news stories. So you can follow us uh, on Twitter at Digital Resistance or Facebook.com forward slash The Digital Resistance. I see. Thanks for coming Thank on you very board, much. The Sputnik. Coming up after the break... How is it that any Muslim returning from Syria to Britain is instantly arrested, but British citizens serving in the Israeli army can come and go to and from the carnage as they please? Don't miss it. There's been a lot of the focus. It's become a very political situation because neither Palestine nor Israel are signed up to the, to the Rome Statute. But we also have to, to look at the fact that the United Kingdom is and countries such as France are also members. And we know that there are uh, British citizens, French citizens, and of course US citizens that are actively fighting with the IDF. And we know that what the IDF has done in this particular incursion constitutes war crimes and crimes against humanity. So there's absolutely no reason why, if we are able to identify those British citizens that have actively engaged, that that matter can't be referred to the International Criminal Court. Very much in the same way that the International Criminal Court is now um, looking into a preliminary inquiry, which is a precursor to an investigation, um, in relation to the conduct of uh, British forces in Iraq. That's uh, good, all very well, but why doesn't the state act? After all, uh, at least my reading of the law is that it is prohibited for British citizens to enlist in foreign armies fight with them and then return here. And if that's true in general, why isn't it true specifically for Israel? Well, again, we go back to the rather unfortunate situation is that there are rules that apply to the rest of the world and unfortunately there are rules that apply to Israel. Um, I mean, I've been quite open about this recently in relation to, to double standards that are applied by both the UK and the US. You know, we see individuals who are uh, teenagers who are, who are detained, tortured in custody, but as soon as one of them has an American passport who's arrested, then America um, takes particular offence to that. And the same as far as the UK is concerned. The, the sad reality is there should not be a different standard applied to those joining the IDF, but there is. But, so the law, but the law officers must be uh, culpable in that. I mean, the law, the law, if the law officers told the police at Heathrow to arrest people returning from Tel Aviv and question them as to whether or not they'd just been fighting yeah. in the IDF, the police would have to do so. Of course, yes. And, but they don't ask these questions. No. What, what, what you have to do is you, you have to be able to provide a fairly compelling dossier to, to law enforcement in this country. Um, identifying individuals 
to be able to, to target those individuals. But, but what is particularly disturbing is that there is no action being taken by these organisations that are um, actually broadcasting the fact that they will help you get into the IDF and they will set you up and they will assist your family. I mean, the, the, this to me um, is, uh, is just there's offensive. A whole, uh, there's a whole cottage uh, industry uh, here in support of the IDF. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. openly advertised uh, in well, certain just, uh, newspapers that you can donate to help right. the right. IDF and so on. And as I understand it, these uh, soldiers are not uh, hiding themselves. Certainly in the US, their pictures They're are glorifying appearing, themselves. glorifying it. Yes. Well, actually, um, before I came on the show this morning, I just looked at one of these websites in particular, and you, and you read the comment section.